So, if you think back to when we had that one billion pounds in carrying out, if you counted every single penny, and what we used to do in those days, um, back before 2000, before the recession, before 2008, so 2005, 6, 7, uh, seems a long time away now. But what we used to do is we would, and we still do some of this, you know, we would do a joint strategic needs assessment. So each of the 152 local authorities would go out and they would look at the, the deficits, in effect, in their communities. And they would, would realise things like, for example, I mentioned Glasgow uh, and the premature male mortality. That would be a massive thing, clearly, in Glasgow. But often you'd find high levels of crime, high levels of illiteracy and innumeracy, high levels of teenage parenthood, you know, but of the nightmare. Yeah, so you basically do the joint strategic needs assessment and it would produce year on year a list of deficits, a list of problems that we were charged with solving in the, in the coming uh, financial year. So those deficits, whatever they were, would then be met with a series of public service commissioning plans. And those of you, and some people in the room I know, will remember the Drug and Alcohol Action Team plans, yeah, where you would sub submit an annual plan about how you, if you're a drug and alcohol uh, treatment provider, how you would um, address those deficits. So that's what we used to do. Here's a whole series of deficits, and here's a list of services that we will commission and pay to address those deficits. Yeah. So at one point, I can't think of any good examples off the top of my head, but um, if a deficit, for example, was um, I don't know, either elderly isolated. Isolated elderly people, clearly a problematic thing. There might be an elderly, an elderly befriending service. I mean, it's, it's easy to look back and think, um, a, friend, a good friend of mine says this was the time of the commissioning as drunken sailors. Yeah. Um, and I always think of structured daycare. You know, at, at the height of that investment, there were some interesting experiments in structured daycare. A uh, colleague of mine always says, just how many coffee pots, how many coffee pots could you paint in reggae colours and call it therapy? Yeah? How, many, how many times could you actually have people doing all manner of stuff in a structured daycare programme that really didn't look like a programme, it didn't look very structured, but something happened during the day. Yeah? So there was a period when the history books are written for, for, the, for the record where a structured daycare Probably, so if, if, if we hit the, the high water mark of one billion pounds, uh, and you've got a structured daycare program and it's not working, what do we look like a drunken sailor? I'll buy another one then. You know. But what about that one you've already got? I don't know. I guess we'll get another one. But this one isn't working, I'm not asked. We'll get another one. And there were some things that went on in that period that actually, obviously, they're being subject to cuts now. But I think when the history books are written, we will want. We will wonder what on earth we were playing at, really, uh, because we had so much money. But obviously, that's gone anyway now. So that's what we used to do. We used to have loads of deficits, and there would be a public service response where somebody was paid Monday to Friday, nine to five, but very <coughs> decent wages to do stuff. That's when the net widened as well into treatment. Another apocryphal tale is you could, well, this one came from. You could be a taxi driver in Sheffield on a Friday, and a drug intervention program over in Manchester on a Monday. Yeah, loads of people came into the into our industry at that period, and we widened the net into treatment services through criminal justice. So that's what we used to do in a time of plenty. And then austerity arrives around 2008. The other thing you need to look at this graph is this is the, Man <coughs> the Greater Manchester one of the slides for Greater Manchester public service reform. And basically, in essence, Manchester, Greater Manchester, the ten. Greater Manchester combined, the same authorities that make up the Greater Manchester combined authority spend over £20 billion pounds per annum on public services. That's from everything from emptying the bins to looking after children and elderly people. And they recoup together, they get back from central government grants and from council taxpayers something like £17. Yeah? Uh, there is a, a deficit, it's, it's in the billions. It's several billion, it might be as high as five billion, it might be as low as four billion or three billion, but it's a lot of money, yeah? It's an awful lot of money. And the, the challenge, uh, obviously the political challenge, because some people in uh, Greater Manchester are quite interested in this thing called Devo Mank, 
So I mean, it's good enough for Scotland, it's good enough for us. If they can have a go at independence, so can we. I'm, this is me, I'm paraphrasing that. But obviously, part of that political um, machinery, part of the political game, is, well, you want, you want to run your own show, you want devolution, Greater Manchester, you want devolution from Whitehall, well then put your, put your own house in order. Yeah? Sort out your public service deficit and become a net contributor to UK PLC as, as opposed to a net drain. And if you do that, I'm paraphrasing, but if you do that, we will then, we being central government, we may, may, may then um, give you more freedom and flexibility to govern yourselves. Yeah, that's the so that's the real that's the big political game that's being played out. Um, but it means that within our world of uh, drug and alcohol treatment, complex dependency. And interesting in the, in the seminar before about the through the gate program and the low numbers of people coming into abstinence-based recovery, which we did anticipate, although it is very low. But interestingly, on those outcomes, there are, there are more people in employment than, are, than who are abstinent. And actually, from a public service perspective, that would be crucial. If people were going back to work, that would be more important that people went back to work than whether they were abstinent or not. Yeah? So in other words, if you had somebody on opioid substitution treatment but employed, compared with somebody who was in abstinence-based treatment but who is a lunchtime philosopher, quote, who can't go to work because they're too busy going to meetings and, and uh, sharing their spiritual wisdom, the social worth, being absolutely brutal about it, would come down on the side of the per person on opioid substitution treatment or maintenance therapy who was employed. Yeah? In other words, it, it would be very difficult to sell ab pure abstinence-based recovery unless that person was working. Because in, in terms of complex dependency, and in public service reform, none of it makes any sense unless people go back to work. Because if, I, if this was a lecture on public service reform, what you would see is the gains that we've made in many places have been offset by people's continual complex dependency and reliance on welfare. This only begins to make any sense whatsoever when people are economically active. Yeah?